Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on mentors and motivators who are consistently reshaping, redefining, and rediscovering the field of medical health care. I would like to welcome Dr. Philip Werschler, a board-certified, internationally recognized expert in both medical and cosmetic dermatology and aesthetic surgery. He has been honored to serve as an FDA investigator for clinical trials throughout his career, and nearly all of the FDA-approved aesthetic injectable dermal fillers, toxins, lasers, and aesthetic devices were tested in his research center. Thank you so much, Dr. Werschler, for joining us today. I understand you've had some uh couple of little snags in your traveling and might have lost your luggage, hence the green Chicago shirt. <laughs> oh, well, actually, I wasn't going to bring it up, but now that you have, um, yeah, a little bit. Um, so I had, you know, everybody that travels, got to have a travel experience. And, you know, if you fly enough, you're going to lose your luggage. It's kind of unique, though, in that I lost the same bag twice within 24 hours. So actually, I haven't had my luggage in, in really in two days now. Um, so, so I thought, well, hey, you know, I'm in Chicago and I like St. Patrick's Day and they dye the river green here. And I went to the closest hotel gift shop and the first t-shirt that I saw was this really cool Chicago green t-shirt. And I thought, hey, you know, that works. And, and, uh, so that's why I'm, I'm in my, my St. Patrick's colored Chicago green t-shirt, because I don't have any other clothes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for, for making the time, considering you are uh, stressing out, or you're actually not quite stressing out. You could care less, really, that you, they've you lost know, your luggage. It's pretty comfortable, right? <laughs> okay. It's a t-shirt. Right. I can be in a coat and tie and swallowing hard and all of that, but ah, now I'm in a t-shirt. Well, thank you. I'm but, sorry. Uh, no, I hope uh, they find it soon. It's, it's nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm excited to, to talk about the future of aesthetics. What initially prompted you to go ahead and, and study medicine? Mm, that's an interesting and see how much time do we have? We no. have all the time uh, that you can spare. The, um, so actually I was a sociology major in college and, and my, my thoughts trended more towards maybe business, something like that. And as graduation approached, uh, you realize that there's really no job market for a sociologist. And I had a couple of friends that uh, were headed towards vet school, another good friend that was headed towards an MBA program. And I thought to myself, you know, med school sounds kind of like fun. And it's almost like that, uh, that old joke, you know, in Animal House, pre-med, pre-law, what's the difference? So I hung around college for a fifth year, which, by the way, I would highly recommend. <laughs> uh, that's always the most fun year. And I took the, the required uh, pre-med courses and, and then applied to medical school. I was, I was fortunate, uh, uh, very fortunate. I was able to get in right away and uh, went into medical school, enjoyed the sciences very much, and really kind of liked dermatology. I thought dermatology was you know, incredibly interesting. Um, what we was have, it about dermatology? Well, we have some sayings in dermatology. We sometimes we call it the ease of dermatology um, that everyone qualifies, meaning if you have skin, you qualify. So we don't discriminate against senior citizens or babies. Um, we don't, uh, you know, we don't we don't discriminate against men versus women. If you have skin, it works, and so that's pretty much everybody. And and uh, and then there's some other things along there. It's you know economically rewarding, and uh, you know it's easy compared to other residencies, and it goes on and on. Sort of an inside joke. Um, so dermatology, I think, is probably the the um, medical specialty field that that best defines the combination of internal medicine, surgical procedures pathology and kind of puts everything together and there's a little bit of every medical specialty in dermatology and that's not something that you can say really I think for any other specialty and so so it turns out that this was before cosmetic dermatology had really kind of reached its stride I mean dermatology has always been to some degree a cosmetic specialty because of the appearance related skin concerns that patients have uh, although traditionally we didn't have a lot of things to offer, uh, we had hair transplants, uh, we had you know the shave removal of moles, we had chemical peels, you know arguably the oldest medical procedure that's ever been documented. Um, so we had some things like that, dermabrasions, the old sanding of the skin. 
but mostly dermatology was an internal medicine subspecialty that also had skin cancer as a surgical component, and and then of course the studying of of the skin in biopsies as the pathology component. And right around the time that that I entered into dermatology was really at about the advent of of lasers. Um, uh, collagen injections were new. And, and so there all of a sudden was this expansion of the field into, into aesthetic procedures or aesthetic dermatology, where I just think it's kind of a nicer sounding name than cosmetic dermatology. Um, so I was lucky enough to be around at the beginning of that. And I had trained at George Washington University for my, my dermatology fellowship. And I had the opportunity to work at NIH. Um, where I learned about, about clinical trials. And essentially, if you are a patient at the National Institutes of Health, it means you're in a trial. And so I had the opportunity to learn trials and to sort of network in that world and decided that I really liked clinical trials. So then when I started practice, I started doing trials uh, as soon as I could, which essentially was right away. And that part of the practice has continued to grow. And I've been fortunate enough in, in that aspect to be part of the, 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 the development cycle, if you want to think of it that way, of the aesthetic procedures. I was one of the original Botox investigators. And, and um, I've done the trials, I think, on all the toxins and all the fillers and many of the laser and energy devices, as well as medical dermatology, acne, eczema, psoriasis, warts, you know, sort of you name it, there's, there's always trials um, to do. And, and so that part very much appeals to me, and we just continued to expand that out. Throughout your journey, which area have you seen the most exponential growth? Well, I guess that you can answer that at, at, at a number of different levels, and it, it depends on your perspective. You know, it's kind of like, is the glass half full or half empty? Traditionally, um, almost every medical dental office was involved in clinical trials. They're doing a little trial here, a little trial there, and it was very much a community-based trials. And one of the things that I have seen um, over, especially like the last decade, is the the emergence of clinical trials really as a, a medical specialty that doesn't really have a residency. So it's sort of an on-the-job training as a medical specialty, which is very different. And and I've seen consolidation. So. Um, sort of the mom and pop approach to doing trials has kind of disappeared and it's consolidated into larger and larger clinical trial centers, many of which are, are not institutionally affiliated, so not part of a university or not part of a large hospital system. It's not that they don't do trials, but in, there's different kinds of trials. And when I refer to clinical trials, I'm really referring to what could be termed commercial trials. So these are the pharmaceutical company sponsored trials for new drugs, new devices, or new indications for existing ones. So we're mostly involved in the commercial trials side versus government funded research or, or academic funded or things like that. And those are, are again, very, very legitimate trials. Um, but but we do we kind of do drug and device trials usually between the the laboratory development what we call sort of the preclinical phase and FDA approval. So so that part has changed dramatically. Um, it's growing tremendously. There's all these new drugs coming out. Uh, you know we read about it almost every day. Uh, whether they're drugs for for dermatologic conditions or others, where we do multi specialty trials. On the aesthetic side, um, aesthetic, aesthetic dermatology has exploded in the last, the last quarter century. You know, it's easier as time goes by to look back historically and say this is when it happened. A lot of times you don't really know when it's happening as to when it's happening. Um, but then you look back and you gain the perspective of time. And so, you know, when did, when did aesthetic dermatology really take off? I think there's some milestones. Um, dermal fillers in the mid to late 80s, uh, neurotoxins, uh, well, while they were out uh, as an orphan drug, and here I'm referring to Botox, uh, in the late 80s, um, it started to be used aesthetically in the early to mid 90s, um, gained a lot of notoriety in the fashion uh, uh, press, the fashion industry, 
and then was approved by the FDA in 2002. And then the first hyaluronic acid filler, which is Restylane, was approved a year later in 2003. And parallel to that development was the, the sort of the refinement and the expansion of energy devices. Energy devices, lasers, but there's other types of energy. And lasers, um, that term is, in, is almost used as, as a catch-all term for anything that plugs into the wall. Uh, but there's radio frequency and there's ultrasound. And it goes on and on and on. So you had the devices develop and you had the, the injections develop. And, and I also think one of, the, um, one of the, the key moments was when the FDA approved Retin-A as a wrinkle cream. And that was the, the first you know, sort of imprimatur of the FDA onto a, an existing product that was only a prescription that, that could be used and had shown efficacy and gained Were you approval. part of that trial? Uh, no, I did not. I did not do that trial. You just I did think, every other trial. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, those those trials. Um, so so Retin A was approved in um, I believe it was the the early to mid nineties. Uh, what had happened is that and it was kind of interesting. Is that we had um, dermatology had noticed that patients, especially women who had adult female acne, and they would be on Retin A for years, they started noticing that their skin wasn't aging in the same way and as fast as, as women who were not using it or were using other types of anti-acne regimens like a topical antibiotic or something. So, so um, we generally uh, credit um, uh, for that component uh, John Voorhees uh, from Michigan as, as being sort of one of the, the bright minds that, that, that picked that up and, and then trials were done and you know the classic photos that were published were the little crow's feet you know around the eye before and after and there actually was a visible difference just from using a cream and that opened up you know a, a, an, an entire new field that now is, is filled with um, what we call cosmeceuticals and which is just a hyphenated name between cosmetic and pharmaceutical interestingly enough the fda does not recognize that name that does not exist but we all use it and we talk about the cosmeceuticals and some cosmeceuticals are prescription products used for aesthetic uh, or or image improvement and others are over the counter that are used the same way and they kind of meet in the middle so so that area has changed and then I think, uh, and, and so that area has exploded. Um, uh, and partly, again, timing was good because you had the baby boomers back in the, in the 80s and the 90s moving into that age where they became more and more concerned with aesthetic issues. And previously, what you really, sort of the concept was wait until you're bad enough for a facelift, then go get one. It's like, well, I want to do something before I need that. And so that what really, that's what really drove that. Um, but at the same time, there was a lot of research um, that, that was conducted in, in, in basic laboratory sciences, understanding the structure and the function of the skin and of the immune system and those interactions. And now we are greatly benefiting with, with it seems like almost every, every, every month, and sometimes it seems like almost every week, there's new approvals for medications for skin diseases. Psoriasis, uh, which you know, classically the old refrain, the heartbreak of psoriasis, could never cure it. You had to learn to live with it. And you'd rub tar and steroids on your body. Now we have shots and it basically makes it go away. And there's many other skin diseases like that. And more recently, the, the more severe eczemas, especially the childhood eczemas. So there's new medicines coming out in all aspects of medical dermatology and, and, and then aesthetic dermatology, which commonly is procedural. So that's kind of an extension, a natural outgrowth of surgical dermatology and skin cancer. Many of the pioneers in, in, in aesthetic dermatology are the, the skin cancer surgeons, the Mohs surgeons, who refined a lot of those techniques and then, oh, and by the way, gee, what's this laser thing and, you know, what's this, you know, what's this injection and how could that make a scar better? And much in the same way that Retin-A makes your acne and your wrinkles better, we found procedures that could make scars or other skin conditions better that also made you look better. So, so dermatology is really like a flower that's blossoming and, and it's just, it's, it, it's expanding on all sides and is, it is 
arguably the most difficult, most challenging, and most competitive specialty in all of medicine to gain entrance to. Uh, I did a lecture yesterday for dermatology residents, and I had six residents, and in dermatology, that's a pretty big program, uh, two a year for the three years, and and we we spent we probably spent 20 minutes talking about the competitiveness to get into a dermatology program and how you had to be an honors graduate and do original research and publish papers and all those sorts of things and 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 how fortunate those residents felt that they had made the cut and were excited about their future careers and and in that situation their careers spanned everything from doing Mohs surgery, to doing dermatopathology, to doing full-on cosmetic practice, as well as medical dermatology. And I think, again, that's one of the interesting things about dermatology is you can really be good at all those things and be a good dermatologist. There's not many fields. You know, you're a, if you're a neurosurgeon, you're probably not working on hearts or bones and joints. It's kind of one or the other. And, and so dermatology is kind of unique that way. And it's also a very small specialty. Uh, dermatology is in, um, uh, uh, in it's in a shortage and in high demand almost everywhere in the country, and and so so it's a it's a great field and 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 I have no regrets whatsoever and would do exactly the same thing again if I had that choice to to make. And as a clinical investigator for as many uh, fillers and, and products and whatnot that you have um, been a part of over the years. How do you decide or how do you select your patient to participate? Well, in clinical trials, um, you have in a, in a protocol, you have certain criteria that you have to have to get in the trial, and we call those the inclusion criteria, and certain criteria that you can't have to be in the trial, and we call those the exclusion criteria. So it's a very, very highly regulated. I think it's the most highly regulated aspect of all of medicine. And when you think about it, it should be, because in dermatology, um, you know, maybe if it's a cream, maybe there's not much downside risk, but when you think about clinical trials and injecting a novel biologic molecule to see if your skin gets better, you know, that's, that's pretty serious stuff. So subjects, as we refer to them in a trial, they're still patients, but they're a subject in a trial. How they're identified, how they're recruited, how they're screened, and then ultimately, if, if they meet all the criteria that it's supposed to meet, um, how they're enrolled in a trial is also extremely highly regulated. So if you are, are driving and you hear on the radio, you know, do, you know, do you have diabetes? There's a clinical trial. Or, you know, is your hair falling out? There's a clinical trial. So you don't though, typically hear, though, if you're suffering from wrinkles and, and want well, to reverse your age by 20 years. You have to be in the right market, I guess. But, but <laughs> no, I, so even the advertisements are regulated um, either directly uh, by the FDA or indirectly through an institutional review board or IRB. So, so how you recruit is, is through sometimes national advertising campaigns, sometimes local advertising campaigns, sometimes out of your own clinic. So let's say you're doing a psoriasis trial and you have psoriasis patients come in and it's a good way to offer them perhaps an opportunity to participate in, in, in the development of maybe a new treatment. And one of the things that, that I've learned um, over, over the decades of doing trials is that many, many, most, and, and, and maybe nearly all of the, of the subjects who are enrolled in a trial, they're very altruistic. They, they, they don't do it because it's the easiest thing to do. In fact, it's harder. There's more visits, and you're in an acne trial. You may be getting blood work and EKGs, and who knows? So, so there's more involved. There's more work for you. Uh, you may, in fact, in all of that, receive a placebo treatment. So you may not get the real, the real drug. And, 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 and you could just as easily, maybe even easier, just go and get a prescription and get a drug and get treated. But patients actually are very altruistic. And, and they, I, I can't tell you how many hundreds or thousands of times I've heard, you know, if this helps somebody else who has the same condition I do, I think it's great and I'm happy to participate. There's almost a role reversal in terms of the, the physician-patient relationship. So 
traditionally the doctor tells you that, well, you know, you need to do this and come back for that and, you know, we'll see how you're doing. And in a trial, you're learning from the patient. The patient does what the protocol says, what you educate them to do, then comes in and tells you how they're doing. And you learn from that. Um, so it's different. It, 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 it's, a, it's a very different dynamic. Actually, um, I think it's a, a far superior dynamic because you truly are working as a team in order to learn about you know this new treatment, this new drug, this new device, and you know how whatever condition you have, aesthetic or or medical responds to that. It, it's a very very different um, uh, relationship. So let's talk about um, one of the most important people in your practice, uh, Sir Harry Nevis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I yeah. couldn't help but chuckle when I saw that on your website. So, um, what yeah, kind of dog yeah. is he? So, or is he not? <laughs> so Nevis um, is the is the the Latinized dermatology word for a mole, um, and uh, I the um, the Latin derivation is is a spot. Um, um, so we have this little this little pug mix, and and he, he's all black, and he's got kind of a, a little crooked face and a snaggle tooth, and one eye sticks out, and, and he's just so ugly. He's adorable, and and uh, and so we were having this like, what should we name him? And he was all black, and I said, well, how about Nevis? And it kind of stuck. So then we played with the name as as you're prone to do, you know, when you when you register animals and things like that. So so a congenital mole um, is is called a, a, a congenital nevus, and if they have hair in them, uh, as they often do, we call them a hairy nevus. So then we said, well, let's call him Sir Harry Nevis, and that's how the name evolved. And actually, he is um, a real, um, not a service dog. But a therapy dog. He's a registered therapy dog, and he's registered through Pet Partners. And uh, my wife Pam is his partner, and and he has to be recertified every every two years. And at his level of certification, he is um, allowed to go into like common areas of of nursing homes and schools and hospitals. Uh, he plays ball. That's his job. He's got a service jacket that he wears when he comes to work. He puts that on. He knows he's working. He grabs a ball because he was raised in the office. And he goes down and and he entertains patients. And, you know, he drops the ball. You kick it or roll it or throw it. And, and he'll get it and bring it back. And that's his job. So what has been the most rewarding part of your medical journey? The most rewarding part? That, that's a tough one to answer because... There's, there's so many rewarding aspects in, in all facets of medicine. And, and it, you know, there's rewarding to you as an individual because maybe you make that great diagnosis that hadn't been made, or maybe you find something. So in dermatology, um, arguably the most serious skin lesion that we have is malignant melanoma. Because of its propensity to spread or metastasize, and because until just recently there really wasn't much in the way of, 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 of chemotherapy or radiation. We do have some newer biologic therapies um, that are, are e e exceptionally effective for metastatic melanoma. And that's in fact what President Carter was treated with just a couple of years ago because he had it in his liver and in his brain. And he is you know, going strong out there, raising money for the latest hurricane uh, uh, victims. And, uh, um, so, so finding a melanoma is always a little bit like hitting the jackpot um, in the sense that, that you just saved that patient's life. And especially if they didn't know about it, you know, back of the scalp or on the back or on the bottom of the foot or something, a lot of people don't know and they can't see those areas. So that's always rewarding. Um, it's, um, there, but there's many other aspects of, 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 of rewards. Um, take a, Take a, a junior high, high school kid who has really bad cystic acne, who is clinically depressed, who doesn't want to go to school, who, who has disengaged from life, um, and, 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 and they come in and you know, they just think that it's, you know, it's the end of their world. And you can treat them, and we have such good medications to treat. And I've often said, I wish I could do like time-lapse photography of a cystic acne patient who comes in and invariably on the first visit, their hair is covering their face and the head is down. They don't want to, they, they avoid eye contact or they're depressed. 
and then you treat them, however you treat them, but you treat them and if you could do time-lapse photography, what you would see is you would see that head come up, you would see the eye contact begin, see the hair you know, starting to be styled or combed or pulled back from the face because they actually are really beginning to feel good about themselves again. And it's not usually the patient, the, the teenage cystic acne patient, that thanks you. Um, it's usually the yeah. parents. And they will send a card or a letter or now today more often an email uh, just saying, you know, thank you so much for giving me my, my son, my daughter back um, because they're, they're back to their old selves and they were just a different person. So there's another way that you can feel rewarded because now you're doing something to help that person be a happier and, and, and hopefully more successful uh, person in whatever way they define that. Um, going forward. And then there's the intractable disease. I think psoriasis is a, is a great example of that. So patients that have lived with horrible psoriasis, covering large parts, maybe the majority of, of their skin surface, who are incredibly uncomfortable. They hurt, they itch, they burn, they leave trails of flakes. People don't want to be around them. They become socially isolated. You know, people are kind of weird when it comes to rashes on the skin. Ah, you know, I don't want to touch, right? Even though it's, it's a harmless condition in terms of not being contagious. Um, and, and, and they didn't have, they didn't really have hope. I mean, they, it was the same stuff over and over and over again of whatever degree of effectiveness it was for them. Um, and then with the advent of the newer medicines, not just biologics, there's pills now and stuff for psoriasis. It's like, gosh, you know, you can take the worst psoriasis patient that you have ever seen, and and in a few months you can have them clear. They can have skin as pretty as yours, and and just back, you know, it, back on the circuit. And and there's also a component of arthritis uh, with psoriasis. Psoriasis also we've learned because of research that has been done um, that there are what we call comorbidities to psoriasis. So just statistically, if you have psoriasis and you are age and weight and blood pressure and lipid profile and all those other things match to a control who doesn't, you'll live four years less. And you'll die of, uh, of, from, compli not of the psoriasis per se, but of complications from the systemic inflammation of the psoriasis. So when you take a few minutes to explain to patients that psoriasis is not a skin disease, psoriasis is a systemic disease. So now we're back to the internal medicine component of dermatology. And, and you, you can let them know by treating it effectively, not just getting rid of the rash on the skin, but treating it internally, you're going to help them live longer, have less in the way of joint destruction, and live a happier, healthier life. So, so there's, there's so many ways to, to answer that. Um, and, 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 you know, probably the neatest thing is you just make people feel better about themselves. You know, if your heart is bad, if your blood sugar is high, if you got a lot of gallstones, you know, if you, if, uh, you know, you have hemorrhoids or whatever the case may be, you know, you're not wearing that on your sleeve. But everything in, you know, potentially everything on your skin is potentially in view of everyone else. So you wear it on your skin. And I think one of the biggest things, if you look at it sort of globally from that 30,000 foot view, is that you help people to, to feel better on the inside because they look better on the outside. And, and, and that is, that's kind of a neat thing. And that's all encompassing. That's medical, that's surgical, that's aesthetic. It's all of that. So how did you come to speak here today at A4M? I have been doing, as I had mentioned, uh, uh, clinical trials and in, in the aesthetic world. And, and I've launched a lot of products. Um, partway through uh, my career, uh, actually I came here to Chicago to Northwestern and I, I did um, uh, what they called the Physician Entrepreneurship Program um, in, in the school of, uh, in the, uh, the, the Kellogg School. And, and it was an AMA sponsored program at the time and it was kind of like an EMBA. It was a year long. And then I went to work for industry, and I was medical director at a pharmaceutical company back in Philadelphia for four years. And that just accelerated the exposure to industry and, and trials. And, and I um, uh, uh, started lecturing more, 
And, and so the combination of doing trials and going out and lecturing, as well as practicing the, 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 the techniques and that, um, just kind of led to, to spending more time sort of on the road, you know, looking for lost luggage and, and things like that. <laughs> um, but uh, I, um, um, so I think here, so, so aesthetic dermatology, if you want to think of it that way, and I don't mean that it's only practiced by a dermatologist, but fillers, toxins, lasers, skin care, so aesthetic dermatology, um, it, it, it's a pretty small field, actually. Dermatology is a very small field. And, and then you're taking a thin slice of dermatologists. But there's also plastic surgeons and oculoplastic and facial plastic and oral maxillofacial surgeons, um, uh, aesthetic surgeons, cosmetic physicians. So it's kind of a melting pot. But the dermatologists tend to be highly involved in the development of these things and the teachings of these things. And so we joke that there's about 100 people around the country that at any given time that are out at, you know, doing lectures at the podium and, and at the meetings. Now, who that 100 people consists of, you know, that varies. And, and there's people that come and go and that. But, but in other words, there's a relatively small number of sort of podium people. And we all know each other. We're all friends. I would say it's a very, very congenial club. Uh, but then dermatologists get along with everyone. We joke this because we're sort of superficial people, you know. <laughs> um, we're only skin deep. But the, um, so here at this First particular... First time you use that joke. Okay. Yeah, 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 right, right. Uh, at, at this particular meeting, uh, the A4M. So I've been aware of A4M for a long time. But I remember going to an A4M meeting early in its gestation. And I went with a, uh, a colleague mentor of mine... Um, a dermatologist by the name of Jim Fulton. And, and Jim Fulton was one of the early pioneers in cosmetic dermatology and just a, a brilliant mind. And sadly, he's passed now. Uh, but he was one of the um, uh, inventors of Retin-A. And, 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 and we were at another meeting in Las Vegas. 20, uh, I, what year is this? This uh, is the 25th year. Yes, yeah, so it was, a, it was close to 25 years ago. And we were actually in Sephora, and we saw this meeting at one of the resort hotels. And so actually, we snuck in. And, and, and we walked in and we looked around, and I'll never forget what he said to me. And this was, it was close to 25 years ago. He said, this, looking at age management, this is the future of, at that time we used the term cosmetic dermatology, we hadn't really coined aesthetic yet. And, and I, I've never forgotten that, and he was prescient in his observation that the future of aesthetic cosmetic dermatology um, is, is age management. And that age management is like a three-legged stool. And there's external age management, and that's what I do. And there's internal age management. So that, that's, you know, that's keeping the heart pumping and, and, and you know, keeping the joints moving and all that kind of stuff. And then the third leg of that stool, which is I think still in, it, in, its, in its infancy is cognitive age management. So you can look good and you can be you know, feeling bad on the inside and you can't remember where you live. But you'll you know. make them look gorgeous. Well, you may look gorgeous. <laughs> but you know, if you think about that, I mean, age management medicine is really, it's a triad of looking good on the outside, looking you know, younger or healthier, whatever your goal is, but also functioning better on the inside. And we're getting pretty good at that too. And also keeping it going up here. And, and, and I, to me, that's the most important part. But the, the cognitive component, which you would suspect would be the domain really of the neurologists. Um, you don't hear nearly as, as much about that. Certainly not like you do for Botox and fillers and, 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 and and, and really not as much, at least in, in, in my, my experience, my exposure, uh, not nearly as much as you would hear about like, you know, growth hormone therapies or bioidentical hormone replacement or, or you know, the primary prevention of cardiovascular disease or all of those kinds of things. And I think it's because we haven't quite gotten there yet. I mean, we're still trying to figure out Alzheimer's. You know, we, what it is, and why are we getting it, and, you know, can we have a blood test? And you look at dementia, and, and, and you look at, 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 at those other aspects of, of cognitive functioning. I think it's behind 
in turn, I think what's out there leading the, the, the sort of the, you know, the tip of the spear um, is aesthetic dermatology. Of course, I'm biased. Um, but, but in other words, you know, um, if you look at Botox, Botox is, depending on, 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 you know, what study you read, it's the like second or third most branded iconic term in the world. And, and so, so people use Botox as a noun, as a verb, as an adverb, as an adjective. It, it's become, it's become a term for something anti-aging put into your body. You know, I'm gonna go get some Botox in my lips. We don't really put Botox in the lips, but fill in those, but people think of it that way. It's kind of like saying, I want a Kleenex, not a facial tissue, or I want to make a, you know, I'll date myself, a Xerox copy, right? Or, or, or saying that I want an iPhone, but you really could be referring to an iPhone or, you know, a Galaxy or, or something else. So, so Botox has done an awful lot to brand the, the field of, of this sort of external age management. Um, now, I'll challenge you, what, what term is there in, in, in neurology and in cognitive management that has branding like that? I, see, I can't it's think done. of one, right? <laughs> um, and, and how about in, in sort of internal age management? You know, is there a branded um, a growth hormone or is there a branded bioidentical hormone or is there well, a branded... Some of the exhibitors and sponsors yeah, here well, might like think to think so. so. Right? <laughs> I, I just went through the exhibit hall. Um, in, in other words, there's not, it, again, at least as in, 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 in my observation, there's not another branding out there that, that signifies not just a particular drug or treatment, but also is, is a euphemism for the entire field. So, so if we joke about, about Botox, what we're really joking about is, is aesthetic dermatology in all of its different manifestations. And, and I think that there needs to be those breakthrough therapies for, for cognitive and for internal management and that branding. And, and I think that's coming. And I think that, um, that some of that, I just lectured on this, um, uh, this summer in Las Vegas and, and I was, uh, I was talking about sort of breakthrough therapies in, in age management. And, and I was, I was kind of focused on, on, um, stem cell, PRP, PRF, and it's kind of an alphabet soup. And people don't, and this is, this is a forward thinking, highly educated group of aesthetic physicians still don't really have a good understanding of what all those things mean. So consequently, when, when I was lecturing on it, um, I went to the, you know, to the web, because that's where we go for all of our information. And, and when you research what actually is, is, is going on, um, so much of that is coming out like of the military, out of what we call DARPA, uh, of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and that's who developed the original internet, and it was called ARPANET. Um, and, and they have a whole um, biotechnology division because they want to regrow fingers and toes and hands and feet on soldiers. And that's stem cell therapy and, and orthopedic surgery um, to regrow or heal joints. And that is, you know, that, is that, that, um, that rejuvenation aesthetically um, that, that is using new technology. So I think that's kind of like the next big new breakthrough. We just don't know where it's going to come from. I mean, before, before neurotoxins were identified, we knew that there was a great opportunity out there for external age management. We just didn't know how we were going to do it. We didn't know what that, you know, what that vehicle was going to be. And then all of a sudden, this orphan drug that was used for some eye diseases and, and that kind of landed on the scene. And all of a sudden, you know, today it is like the number one cosmetic treatment worldwide. So I think that there's going to be something coming. I don't, at this point, my, this is just personal opinion. I'm not sure that that, that regenerative aesthetics breakthrough is going to come out of regenerative aesthetics. I think we're going to borrow it from regenerative neurology, regenerative wound healing, regenerative uh, uh, you know, orthopedics, or, or, or whatever the case may be. And, and I think that we'll grab it and, and that we'll, we'll adapt it 
to the aesthetic component. And that may be internal, and that may be external, and that may be cognitive. But there's a saying that we are our own supermarkets, meaning that all those raw materials that we need are already in us. Fat is full of stem cells. Um, we know that we can activate fat. We can activate those stem cells. There's recent literature out on how to change the characteristics of stem cells. And I think that there is a constellation of forces that is beginning to take place. Part of it is, is, is the human genome sciences. It's what we've learned about genetics, what we've learned about gene expressions, proteonomics, epigenomics, and that, that whole field. Part of it is technology advancing in computing and understanding how to interpret these things. And then part of it is learning. Um, and, and so much of it is, is really, in many ways, immunology-based. Immunology has just exploded. Um, and, and interestingly enough, a lot of our, our basic research in immunology um, um, over the last several decades has been prompted by looking for better treatments and ideally one day cures or vaccines for HIV. So it's interesting how things kind of kind of come full circle. So I think that, you know, not in 10 or 20 years, um, you know, is it going to be next year? I don't know, maybe. But, but in the near term future, three, five, seven years, sometime in there, you're going to see some real breakthroughs in regenerative aesthetics that's going to come out of regenerative medicine and and much of that basic work is going to be stimulated by this research some of which is coming out uh, as, as I mentioned out of DARPA uh, and the US is not necessarily the leader there's a lot of this stuff going on in Asia especially um, and we kind of took a time out for a while because of uh, and I, I don't mean to get political um, but there was a period of time in which research using stem cells um, was severely inhibited by by the policies um, of the of the government of the US government and so so why we were at the leading edge of this uh, we fell behind and and in fact some of our best talent went abroad and and so now we're playing kind of a catch-up uh, but there's some um, a lot of other smart scientists out there and researchers and physicians that have been working on this and I think that in in many ways they're ahead of us on that um, and, you know, you take that extension in whatever way you want. You think about regrowing a finger or a hand. Um, well, you know, if you can do that, how hard would it be to regrow some new collagen or new fat or new bone in your face, give you a stronger chin or, you know, bigger eyes or all those sorts of things? And I have a, a favorite. It's kind of a little trick. Um, I have a favorite lecture I like to give. And in this lecture, I have these quotes. And the quotes were from the Wall Street Journal. And the quotes talk about the future, and they talk about things like, um, uh, you know, skin that may be plaid or maybe speckled or, or, or you know, um, breasts that expand upon a demand naturally uh, without, without silicon and, and things like that. And, and the, the implication is that if any of that exists in nature, chameleons, puffer fish, things like that, if anything exists in nature, there's a code. There's a genetic code. And there are proteins and enzymes that control that. And once we learn how to read that code and use that code, theoretically, all of those things could be adopted to, to us, to humans. And, and so the future um, of, of aesthetics and the future of regenerative aesthetics and that, I think that the playbook's already written. We just haven't figured out how to read it translate it, transcribe it, and, and then put it to use. But the trick is that um, the quotes I have in my slides, and I just used them this summer on the, um, on the sort of introduction to regenerative aesthetics lecture, the quotes were all taken from the millennium edition, 1-1-2000 of the Wall Street Journal. And, but I don't tell them that until the very end. So what's interesting is that, that they were you know, it's like kind of like the science fiction novel. It's like Star Trek, you know, with the communicator, which is becoming the iPhone. It's like Dr. McCoy's surgical instruments, which, you know, now we have lasers, you know, and this kind of stuff. So, so a lot of that, of what we're experiencing now, was predicted. 
and was written about in sort of a, almost like a, a tongue-in-cheek kind of way. It's coming true here 17 years later. There's a lot of stuff happening out there. And again, if we can regrow one body part for something, then why can't we regrow other body parts for enhancement? And, and I, I, it's, it's not far-fetched. It's real. It's here. We're just working out the details. Are you utilizing PRP or stem cell therapies in your practice? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And we have been for some years. And there again, you know, so PRP and aesthetics, probably the area that, so, so, and there was just on one of the, I think it was one of the, the Furus Biotech or Furus Pharma. It's all these, these newsletters, kind of daily industry newsletters. I think I subscribe to them all. Um, but recently there was one, uh, there was, a, and I think it was in there, um, but there was um, um, a, 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 a quote that one of the things that is holding back the development of, of these new, um, uh, uh, you know, autologous therapies is that there's no big pharma behind them. There's no Allergan, Novartis, Lilly, you know, Pfizer behind them. So they don't have those those hundreds of millions and billions of dollars being dumped in because they see a return on that investment, like a, a cholesterol-lowering pill or a Viagra or some new biologic therapy. And so they're sort of bumping and creeping along, but but that that pharma is they they're not, it's on the radar. They know and they're watching. So if you look at 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 stem cell slash PRP, because the lines aren't really all that clear. Micronized fat transfer, things like that. The one area in aesthetic and rejuvenative aesthetics in, in dermatology where there's the, the, the best level of evidence is in hair loss. And and so you you draw off blood, you know, you do your double centrifuge, you process, activate, mix with whatever your recipe is, and then you inject it in one way or another back into the scalp. Um, and it's using men and women both. And there are actually some, some pretty decent articles. Um, part of the challenge is that, that um, we don't have, a, we don't have a, a set guideline. You know, if you have a pill for blood pressure, you can calculate precisely how many points your blood pressure drops based on the dosing of the pill. And it's, it's a very easy equation. It's a lot harder to say, well, there's a little bit more hair growth and where there's a lot more hair growth. I read an article um, a month or two ago. Interesting article. It was not from the U.S. because it would probably never happen in the U.S. I believe it was from India. And these uh, doctors, um, they uh, gave... So there are these drugs that you can take, um, like before chemotherapy and that, which will stimulate your bone marrow to make more, more bone marrow based stem cells and precursor cells and that. Um, and there were these um, uh, physicians in India that gave these drugs to some patients before harvesting PRP and stem cells because they thought they would flood the body with all these progenitor cells. Then they used it for, for stimulating hair growth. And, and it worked, and it seemed to work better. And I thought, you know, that was amazingly insightful. That wasn't even on my radar because I practice within the constraints of, of our guidelines and our FDA. And, and, and so I actually brought that up to a friend of mine who's a medical oncologist. And, and we had a nice little chat about it. And he said, well, you know, they're really pretty safe drugs. They're very expensive, but they're really very safe. And he said, you know, I could see why that would work because, you know, when we use them in oncology, you know, we, we use them for that purpose. And I'm thinking, see, you know, we might borrow something out of oncology. And, and, and that, so if there's this stuff going on all over the world and, and it's very exciting. So coming back to, to Dr. Fulton's pressing it comment, I think the future of aesthetic medicine, I think the future of regenerative medicine and all of that um, is, is really um, uh, exemplified by, by A4M. And I've had that in the back of my mind for literally about 25 years. And I've seen the growth and the expansion and the, um, I guess, the maturity um, of, the, of, the, of the, the group and, and the data and, and things that are, that, are, that are presented. 
and I'm very impressed, and, and I'm happy to be here, and happy to be, you know, happy to have an invitation to the party. Thank you so much, yes, Dr. Bushler. Yes. This was wonderful, and you're charming, and just I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you. I enjoyed chatting with you.